Welcome to a new class in PEP's online course on child well-being. In this class, we will study some concepts related to child labor. The outline of the course includes 1. The history behind the work of children, 2. The definition of child labor, 3. The laws and international conventions regarding children working, 4. The worst forms of child labor, 5. Statistics estimating the number of children working and those working in hazardous activities, 6. A theoretical time allocation model, 7. The causes of child labor, 8. Econometric estimation, 9. The consequences of child labor, and 10. The policies implemented to mitigate or eliminate child labor. This class is structured following Chapter 57 by Eric V. Edmonds, entitled Child Labor, from the Handbook of Development to Economics, Volume 4, 2008, but plenty of literature is made available to complement it. There are older and more recent studies on child labor. Although child labor existed long before the Industrial Revolution, its incidence has increased since then. The ideas of earlier writers such as Karl Marx, Alfred Marshall, and Arthur Pigo, among others, contributed to the development of our contemporary mathematical models and theoretical constructs related to child labor. In 1867, Marx wrote about the incidence of child labor in factories, describing that with the advent of machinery, decreased labor time and consequently wages and family incomes all members of a family were having to work to make ends meet. Marshall wrote in 1920 about a large increase in child labor in the Industrial Revolution and the importance of schooling. He was arguing that parents should be incentivized to invest in human capital by making a better future for their children by having them go to school. In 1932, Pigo defended the eradication of child labor but he was aware of the aggravation of poverty when poor families fall below subsistence level. After the problems involving child labor were largely discussed among 19th century writers, the theme was neglected by economists for a long period. Interest in research and economic analysis related to child labor reappears in the literature around 1995, mainly because child labor was seen as an impediment to economic progress due to a growing body of literature suggesting that the reduction of poverty and the accumulation of human capital were key factors to achieve economic progress. Empirical analysis, trying to study the causes and consequences of child labor, are now being facilitated by the increase in the availability of high-quality microdata and ease of obtaining computational data. The International Labor Organization, ILO, created the International Program on the Elimination of Child Labor, IPEC, in 1992 with the objective of the progressive elimination of child labor. According to ILO, child labor not only prevents children from acquiring the skills and education they need for a better future, but it also perpetuates poverty and affects national economies through losses in competitiveness, productivity, and potential income. Withdrawing children from child labor, providing them with education, and assisting their families with training and employment opportunities contribute directly to creating decent work for adults. Child labor is a polemic issue. Important questions to ask are, should all work performed by children be called child labor, and should it all be eliminated? Most of the organizations and researchers agree that works that do not affect children's and adolescents' health and development and do, not def and do not interfere with their schooling can be positive, providing them with skills and experience. IOL then defines child labor as work that deprives children of their childhood, their potential and their dignity, and that is harmful to their physical and mental development. It refers to work that is mentally, physically, socially, or morally dangerous and harmful to children, and or interferes with their schooling by depriving them of the opportunity to attend school, obliging them to leave school prematurely, or requiring them to attempt to combine school attendance with excessively long hours of work 
and or heavy work. Minimum age of employment changes from country to country, and in each country there are changes to legislation through the years. In Bolivia, minimum age of employment is 10 years old. In Nigeria, 12 years old. In Nepal, 14 years old. South Africa, 15 years old. And in Brazil, it is 16 years of age. A large challenge is enforcing the laws. Although in many countries there is a law prohibiting children from working at a lower age, it is common to see a large percentage of them working. In 1973, ILO, in trying to reduce child labor, created Convention No. 138, requiring countries to set a minimum age of 15 years old under which no one should work or be employed, except for light work and artistic performances at age 14 and prohibiting hazardous activities for those under 18. To date, 173 countries ratified this convention. Another important convention ratified by all the 187 countries that are members of the United Nations International Labor Organization was Convention No. 182. Created in 1999, its main goal was to end the worst forms of child labor around the globe, including slavery, debt bondage, sexual exploitation, the use of children in drug trafficking and armed conflict, or any other illicit or hazardous work, which is likely to harm the health, safety, or morals of a child. Besides illicit activities, it is difficult to classify other activities as hazardous since children can face hazards in the most common types of work. Forestieri, 1997, argues that children differ from adults in terms of anatomical, psychological, and physiological characteristics, which make them more susceptible to the dangers posed by the absence of safety at work, with more severe effects and possibly permanent impairment. It is common to see reports of children's injuries in operating machinery in agriculture, industry, construction, and other sectors. Also, most children work in agricultural activities and are exposed to toxic substances such as herbicides or pesticides. This graph shows the percentages and the number of children and youth from 5 to 17 years of age working and also doing hazardous work. Observe that the largest bubbles are in Africa and Asia Pacific. These two regions account for almost 9 out of 10 children working worldwide. The ILO's 2017 Statistical Information and Monitoring Program on Child Labor, SIMPOC, estimated that there are around 152 million children working worldwide, of which 73 million are in hazardous working conditions. The table shows regional preference of child labor. Observe that Sub-Saharan Africa is the region where child labor is most prevalent, where one in five 72 million children are working, and almost 9% working in hazardous activities. Sub-Saharan Africa is followed by Asia and the Pacific. This map from the ILO shows the share of children engaged in economic activity and household chores in different countries where data is available. Observe that in Sub-Saharan Africa there are countries with more than 30% of their children involved in these activities. In Central and South America, the percentages are, in general, lower than 10%. According to the ILO, these estimates are amongst children aged 5 to 17 and refer to children 5 to 11 years old who, during the reference week, did at least one hour of economic activity or at least 21 hours of household chores. Children 12 to 14 years old who, during the reference week, did at least 14 hours of economic activity or at least 21 hours of household chores, and children 15 to 17 years old who, during the reference week, did at least 43 hours of economic activity. This figure from the ILO shows a trend of declining numbers in child labor through the years. From 2000 to 2016, we observe a reduction of 94 million children working and a reduction of 98 million children in hazardous work. This indicates real advances made in the fight against child labor. There are differences between boys and girls involved in child labor.
girls have higher participation rates in domestic work and lower participation rates in market work compared to boys. Domestic work means working in the home of a third party and is different from household chores. Girls are also more involved in family farming, textiles and sewing, commerce, handicrafts, and private house services. Boys, on the other hand, are engaged in construction, industries, wooden furniture manufacturing, and farm activities. Domestic work is considered a worst form of child labor, as it is not regulated and it is difficult to inspect. Girls may be forced to work excessive hours without adequate food, deprived of sleep, prohibited from studying, and in many cultures, sexual favors are part of the job. This slide gives you some sources of data on child labor. The main sources are from the International Labor Organization, ILO, UNICEF, and the World Bank, but there are also countries' household surveys with questions regarding the work of children, number of hours worked, kinds of activities, and so on. ILO's Statistical Information and Monitoring Program on Child Labor, SIMPOC, computes global estimates of child labor using household surveys around the world. There is also the UNICEF's Multiple Indicator Cluster Survey, MICS, and the World Bank's Living Standards Measurement Study, LSMS. Bjorn Grimsrud, 2001, has an interesting study comparing data from LSMS, MICS, SIMPOC. Many problems arise when collecting data on child labor. First, who fills out the questionnaire? Parents may hide the fact that their children work and may not answer the survey questions appropriately. Second, measures are sensitive to the recall period. Usually surveys ask about the work performed a week before the interview. However, it is common to see children working intermittently, for example, during harvest seasons. Third, many surveys do not collect data on household chores, and there is a large percentage of mainly girls working long hours in their household. Fourth, the most vulnerable group of children may not be reached by surveys, such as those living in the streets. Fifth, illicit activities are not revealed in surveys, but many children are involved in drug trafficking, prostitution, and bonded labor. Finally, in places where there are threats of sanctions, the number of children working is underreported or hidden, as, for example, in cocoa farms, textile factories, etc. Children usually do not participate in the formal wage labor market. They are mainly involved in the informal sector of the economy, which means that they are not officially employed. They are involved in more precarious sectors of activities. They do not have job security. They are not well paid for their work, and sometimes they do not receive payments. Activities include street vending, agriculture, family farms, informal manufacturing, mining, construction, brick making, domestic work, and household chores, amongst others. Around the globe, the percentage of children working in rural areas is much higher than in urban areas. They work in fields and on farms, harvesting, planting, caring for animals, and livestock. Following Edmonds' 2008 study, we will present a simple analytical time allocation model to help elucidate the basic points analyzed in the child labor literature. In this model, we will consider one parent, one child, and two time periods, the child's youth, when parents allocate his or her time, and the child's future. The child's future welfare is V, and the family's current standard of living is S. The utility representation of parental preferences U is a function of S and V. The child's time is allocated amongst education E, leisure and play P, work outside the household M, and work inside the household H, such that E plus P plus M plus H equals 1. A linear homogeneous production function produces the standard of living S which depends on purchased input C and the input of a child's time working H and can be represented by a function F of C and H. The child's future welfare B depends on the positive diminishing
matching marginal product production function, represented by a function r of e and p. Besides the opportunity costs of education intrinsic in the time constraint, schooling involves direct costs, e, assumed to be increasing with the time spent in education, or small e times capital E. An exogenous wage, W, is paid when working outside the household, and this work is freely available. Goods, C, are purchased with non-child income, Y, plus wage times the time spent in the market work, minus the cost of education, times the amount of time allocated to education. That is, C is equal to Y plus W times M minus small e times capital E where Y is an exogenous non-child income produced by the parent's labor supply, assumed to be inelastic. We now present the utility function U as a function of S and V. We then substitute S by the function F of C and H, and we substitute V by the function R of E and P. Knowing that C is equal to Y plus W minus M minus small e times capital E, we substitute this expression into C. A parent maximizes this utility function with respect to E, P, M, and H, subject to their child's time allocation amongst education, leisure, work outside the household, and work inside the household, or E plus P plus M plus H, which equals 1. It is interesting to observe in this theoretical model that to study the impact of child labor on schooling, we do not need to focus only on work outside the household. Let's imagine a child who does not attend school, or E equals zero. Then the derivative of U with respect to V times the derivative of R with respect to capital E is less or equal to lambda, plus the derivative of U with respect to S times the derivative of F with respect to c times small e, which means that the family's marginal utility obtained through increasing child welfare from additional education is less or equal to the family's marginal utility from the foregone consumption resulting from the costs of schooling plus the marginal utility of time lambda. The marginal utility of time depends on how parents value leisure and playtime for child welfare, the marginal utility of the standard of living, and how time spent in market work and household production affects the standard of living. Both wage contribution and household production contribution may affect children's schooling and not only market work. This framework helps us to understand why children work. First, Poverty is an extremely important factor in explaining why children work, as it influences how a family divides a child's time between household production and the formal labor market. It may also affect the production function for future child welfare. Second, the relative return to a child's time in school is important. It depends in part on the return to education as well as the return to play, leisure, the return to child time in home production, the return to formal labor income, and the direct costs of schooling. Third, parental preferences have a key influence in decisions on how a child's time is allocated. Preferences affect how a family divides a child's time between work and non-work activities. For example, a child does not attend school and enters the job market if the derivative of U with respect to V times the derivative of R with respect to capital E is less or equal to the derivatives of U with respect to S times the derivative of F with respect to C times W plus small e, which means that the marginal utility from the return to education is less or equal to the marginal utility from the child's contribution to the production of the standard of living through wages and no educational costs. It is extremely important to understand what factors contribute to a child's working if we want to combat child labor. We will focus on the economic and family aspects, although there are many others. Economists distinguish between factors related to the supply side 
or the demand side of market. However, since many children in low-income countries work in a family production inside their own homes, it becomes difficult to distinguish between a child's labor supply and demand. We will analyze seven factors affecting child labor that are discussed the most in the literature, although there are others. One of the main causes of child labor is poverty. The reason for a negative association between child labor and family income can be explained by the theoretical model. Basu and Van, 1998, developed a child labor theoretical model considering that parents are altruistic and put their children to work only if there is a lack of income for the family to survive. Leisure and schooling are considered luxury goods. They called this the axiom of luxury. Therefore, parental preferences consider child labor as bad and as income increases, parents choose to have children work less. The authors also consider the axiom of substitution in which adult and child labor are substituted. In the theoretical model presented earlier, the fact that child leisure gives positive utility to the family translates into the idea of work being as bad as in the Basu and Van model. Empirical evidence shows that lower income countries are likely to have higher rates of child labor. For example, cross-country data shows a negative correlation between per capita gross domestic product, GDP, and children from 7 to 14 years old that are working. A high incidence of child labor is observed in very poor countries, such as the Cameroon, Niger, Nepal, Nicaragua, and others, as you can observe in the graph in the next slide. Edmonds, 2005, discussed the case of Vietnam as being an example of a country that reduced its amount of child labor by a large amount, accompanied by an increase in GDP. This graph from the World Bank shows the incidence of child labor among 7 to 14 year old children according to the country's GDP per capita. The colors represent the regions and the bubble sizes are proportional to the population of 5 to 14 year old children in each country. Although we cannot interpret this as a causal relationship, it can be observed that poorer countries such as the Cameroon, Guinea-Bissau, and Sierra Leone have a high incidence of child labor, while relatively richer countries, such as Chile, have a small proportion of children working. Care should be taken regarding the numbers, as illicit activities are not in the data. Although, at a country level, we observe a negative relationship between child labor and income, at a household level, it is not so easy to relate household income to the prevalence of child labor. Difficulties in studying the link between economic status and child labor are due to the fact that existing surveys usually do not measure supply of child labor, but incidence of child labor, which also depends on demand. Children may not be working due to less access to potential employers by poorer families. The studies use mainly cross-sectional data and rarely panel data. When comparing poor to rich households, there are unobserved factors that are also associated with child labor. Parents and a child's motivation and a child's ability, for example. There are also measurement errors and variables and endogeneity problems, and consequently it is difficult to know if poverty affects child labor or if child labor affects poverty. Some important questions to be answered. Is a family's standard of living the main determinant of child labor? Are returns to leisure and schooling ranked so high that they would take children out of work if a family's income increased without further policy? The role of children's work in the family's standard of living varies a lot from country to country and within each country, resulting in different outcomes in the empirical literature when studying the effect of a family's income on child labor. Ersado, 2005, studied Nepal, Peru, and Zimbabwe and concluded that poverty was the main cause of child labor in rural areas but not urban areas. Balotra, 2006, using rural data from Pakistan, concluded that boys work due to poverty, finding negative wage elasticity. On the other hand, Balotra and Hedi, 2003, 
using surveys from rural Pakistan and Ghana, showed that children of land-rich households were more likely to work than children of land-poor households. Since most children in poor countries work on family farms, it reflected the demand side and was called the wealth paradox by the authors. Empirical studies try to address the indigeneity problem by excluding the child's income from the family's income. For example, in the study by Durier and Aarons Kuning, 2003. However, this approach does not deal with the joint nature of child time allocation and family living standards. Other studies rely on strong assumptions that there are factors affecting family income, but not the children's time allocation, except through family income. See, for example, Balotra's 2007 study. Another approach to take into account the differences between poor and rich families is to track children over time. Beagle et al. 2006 used three years of panel data in rural Tanzania and concluded that children work more when family income decreases. Besides income, another important variable affecting child labor is credit constraints, which is more common among the poor. Several studies that tried to analyze the effect of credit constraints on child labor and schooling considered the link between child labor and economic shocks, such as unemployment or crop failures. However, it is difficult to disentangle credit constraints from other market imperfections. A study by Durier, Lamb and Levison, 2007, found that child labor increases and child schooling decreases when a household's male head is unemployed. Another factor is parental co-residence. Usually, the absence of a parent is associated with a family income variation and a higher necessity of the children to fill in for the work normally performed by the absent parent. However, this relationship between child and adult work depends on the types of activities considered and may reduce the employment options open to children. Research conducted by Moling, 2004, showed that living apart from one parent or both results in increasing child work and decreasing school attendance in the United States. The fourth factor is birth order. The mechanism through which birth order may affect investments in children are related to a parent's age, socialization, income constraints, and more competition in the household. Emerson and Souza, 2002, showed that older boys and girls are more likely to work and less likely to study in Brazil than their younger siblings. Similarly, Edmund, 2006, found the same pattern in Nepal, he observed that the oldest girls performed more household chores when there are more younger siblings. The fifth factor is sibling sex composition. Studies that tried to explain the link between sibling sex composition and child labor discuss rivalry, peer effects, or sex typing. Researchers studying developing economies emphasize rivalry, while those studying developed economies emphasize peer effects and sex typing. Sibling rivalry means that a child is in a better position when more siblings are comparatively less valued in terms of market opportunities, preferences, social status, etc. Edmonds, 2006, using data from Nepal, observed that older girls work more than their brothers, and this work increases with the number of younger siblings. Let us now look at another important factor affecting child labor which is the parents' education levels achieved. Children of better educated parents have more propensity to study and less propensity to work. This effect is probably capturing part of an income effect since income variables are usually subject to measurement errors. Rosati and Zanatos, 2006, observed that Vietnamese children of more educated parents have a lower likelihood of working full-time than children from less educated parents. Finally, the seventh factor is when parents started working as children. Children of parents who started working very early in life are more likely to be child laborers as well. Emerson and Souza, 2003, observed that for Brazil. We will now show some econometric estimations that can be applied to real data analysis. Many articles use binary response models, such as Logit or Probit, as well as the bivariate Probit model, 
or the multinomial logit models to estimate the impact of exogenous variables on child labor and schooling. We will quickly present these models. Ray, 2000, estimated probit and logit models for child labor participation using data from Peru and Pakistan. He included as right-hand side variables child characteristics, gender and age enrolled in school, family characteristics, poverty status, expenditures, region of residence, gender and age of household head, years of schooling and wages of a female member community characteristics, water, sewage, electricity, and some prices. His main interest was in poverty, which was statistically significant for Peru, but it was not significant for Pakistan. The most important result was that more female adult education leads to lower child labor. Emerson and Sousa, 2003, estimated a probit model to investigate if the parent's status as a child laborer affected the incidence of child labor in their own children. We will now present a basic econometric description of the probit and logit models. For more details, please consult Wooldridge 2019 or Green 2018 or any other econometric textbook that you are familiar with. Let y star be an unobserved variable such that y star equals x times beta plus epsilon. We then have y equals 1 if y star is greater than 0, and y equals 0 if y star is less or equal to 0. x is the matrix of exogenous variables, and beta is the vector of coefficients to be estimated. The error epsilon is independent of x, and if epsilon has the standard normal cumulative distribution function, it will give rise to the probit model. On the other hand, if epsilon has the logistic distribution function, it will give rise to the logit model. The response probability for y is then given by the probability of y equaling 1 given x, which is equal to the probability of y star being greater than 0 given x. If we substitute y star by x times beta plus epsilon, we will obtain the probability of epsilon being greater than minus x times beta given x, or 1 minus the cumulative distribution function represented by capital F at minus x times beta, which is equal to the cumulative distribution function F at x times beta, since the normal and the logistical functions are symmetrical. Our primary goal is to obtain the effect of a specific variable x underscore j on the probability of y equaling 1 given x. This marginal effect is not given by beta since the function f is not linear. The derivative of the probability of y equaling 1 given x with respect to x underscore j being equal to the density function evaluated at x beta times the parameter beta j. We will now look at the multinomial logit model. Moyi, 2011, uses the multinomial logit model to study child labor and schooling in Kenya. In this model, different choices are related to children's activities. Let us consider as an example the following schooling and work categories. P1 is the probability of children only studying. P2 is the probability of children studying and working. P3 is the probability of children only working. P4 is the probability of children neither studying nor working. In this case, there are four categories J equals 1, 2, 3, and 4, where the total number of categories M is 4. The first category is the reference. Then a specific probability P for each category J equals the probability of Y equals J given X, which is equal to the exponential of X times beta J divided by 1 plus the sum of the exponential of x times beta k summing over k from 2 to m for j equals 2, 3, and 4 and knowing that beta 1 equals 0. Let us now look at the bivariate probit model. This model allows the disturbances in the two probit equations to be correlated to account for the interdependency between schooling and work decisions, for example. Let z equal 1 when children attend school and z equal 0 otherwise. 
Similarly, let y equal 1 when children work and y equal 0 otherwise. The specification is that z star equals w times alpha plus epsilon 1. In this case, z equals 1 if z star is greater than 0 and is 0 otherwise. Also, y star equals x times beta plus epsilon 2. In this case, y equals 1 if y star is greater than 0 and is 0 otherwise. We assume that epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 have a normal bivariate distribution, which means 0, variance is 1, and covariance RHO. Durier and Ahrens Kuning, 2003, in a study on Brazil, and Kamar Bagwala, 2008, for a study on India, used bivariate probit models to estimate children's work and school attendance equations. The problem with the bivariate probit model is that to obtain a marginal effect of a variable, it is necessary to evaluate the joint density, which is more complicated and requires a clear understanding of what is being analyzed. The final model we will look at is the Tobit model, or the censored regression model. Balotra, 2007, estimated labor supply using Tobit models. She found a negative wage elasticity for boys in rural Pakistan when conditioning the labor supply model on non-labor income and other demographic variables. Also, Balotra and Hedy, 2003, used Tobit models as many children did not participate in farm work. In the Tobit model, the dependent variable is continuous over strictly positive values, but it is zero for a significant fracture of the population. For example, the number of hours worked by a child is observed in many surveys, but for a large fraction of children that are out of the labor market, the dependent variable is zero. Consider a latent variable y star such that y star equals x times beta plus epsilon, where y equals y star if y star is greater than zero, and y equals zero if y star is less or equal to zero. Assuming that epsilon has a normal distribution with a mean zero and a variance sigma square, it is possible to show that the expectation of y given y greater than zero and x is equal to x times beta plus sigma times lambda evaluated at x times beta divided by sigma, where lambda is called the inverse of Mills ratio and is the ratio between the standard normal probability density function and the standard normal cumulative density function. This equation shows why using ordinary least squares only for observed data, or y greater than zero, will not estimate consistently the parameters beta as we are omitting the lambda term. We show in this slide some stata commands to help you estimate the econometric models. For more details, please consult the stata manuals. We will now talk about the consequences of child labor. The main consequences of child labor are related to lower school level attainment, negative performance in school, reduction in wages, and health damage. In practice, it is difficult to isolate the effect of exogenous variables that affect either schooling or child labor. Child labor decisions in schooling are joint outcomes out of a single time allocation problem. Observe in the theoretical model discussed earlier that child labor, schooling, and leisure decisions are jointly determined. Trying to circumvent this problem, we can use timing differences between observed adults or older children and the occurrence of child labor. Instrumental variable approach is necessary to avoid endogeneity. Beagle, Dehigia, and Gatti, 2005, used panel data from Vietnam to analyze the impact of child labor on education, wages, and health. They compared children working with children not working but all of them being enrolled in school. In this way, they avoid confounding the effect of working with the effect of not being in school. After using community rice prices as the instrumental variable to control endogeneity, they observed that for each additional hour a child works, there is a decrease in the probability of attending school and in completing school five years later. Elahi, 
Orizam, and Sedlasek, 2000, using data from Brazil, showed that starting to work before age 13 resulted in a reduction of 13 to 17 percent in wages when they were adults compared to those who started working at an older age. Casu Fetal, 2015, also showed negative effects of child labor on earnings in adult life in the Brazilian labor market. Another study showing educational loss due to child labor is by Casu Fetal, 2020, that analyzed the impact of children's household chores and market labor using data from Brazil. The fixed effect model and the instrumental variable approach control the endogeneity of child labor. The results showed a decrease in mathematics and Portuguese test scores when children worked in the labor market and or at household chores. Another consequence of child labor is its effect on health. As discussed before, children may suffer physical injuries at work which may result in health problems not only during childhood but also in adult life. They may also suffer psychological stress that perpetuates through their whole lives. Casu Fetal, 2001, showed that Brazilian adults who started working earlier in life had worse self-reported health status. Let us now look at some policies that have taken place to mitigate the problems related to child labor. One of the policies are awareness campaigns that have the objective of transmitting to society, and mainly to parents, the idea that children should be in school and not be working. They are important to change cultural norms. Another way to reduce child labor is by improving school quality. Jafari and Lahiri, 2005, showed that when credit markets operate, improving school quality is more effective in reducing child labor than in-kind transfers. An effective policy to increase schooling and decrease child labor has been through the Conditional Cash Transfer Program, CCT, implemented around the globe. The two largest CCT programs in the world are Mexico's Prospera and Brazil's Bolsa Familia. These programs provide income to poor families conditional on school children being enrolled and attending school. Pregnant or breastfeeding women going to prenatal and postnatal health care services, and small children being vaccinated. Grants are important to families, not only to cover the direct costs, school fees, books, uniforms, etc., but also the opportunity cost of time in school, that is, the reduction of the time children spend working or doing other activities if they spend more time studying in school and at home. Given that there are a fixed number of hours in a day, the time a child spends working is balanced with other uses of his or her time. Therefore, if a program is effective in increasing enrollment and attendance, it may also be effective in decreasing child labor, or at least in reducing the number of hours a child works per day. A study by Ferro et al., 2010, using household survey data from 2003, showed that the Brazilian CCT program reduced children's work participation. Revalian and Woden, 2000, evaluated the impact of the Bangladesh Food for Education program on child labor and schooling. They found a positive effect on school attendance and a negative effect on child labor. However, the decrease in the amount of time spent in labor corresponded to a small share of the increase in schooling time indicating that time dedicated to school was mainly subtracted from leisure and not from work time. Also, Schultz, 2004, when analyzing the Mexico program, observed a reduction in market work, and Shadi and Aruja, 2008, came to the same conclusion for a program in Ecuador. Another policy adopted focused on the restrictions and the prohibitions on employment. Laws prohibiting child labor occur worldwide, but they are not always enforced. There are also international conventions, such as the ILO Convention 138, that has 173 ratifications, imposing restrictions on the age of employment, and the ILO Convention 182, with 187 ratifications, with the goal of identifying and eliminating the worst forms of child labor. 
Bharadwaj et al. 2020 analyzed India's legislation against child labor and, consistent with Basu and Van's theoretical model, concluded that child employment increased instead of decreased and child wages decreased after the ban. The explanation is that at a subsistence level, families, to survive, have their children work more in response to a decrease in child wages. Finally, we analyze the trade sanctions policy against child labor. Developed countries have called for trade sanctions and consumer boycotts of products made with child labor when developing countries have high levels of child labor. Consumers are advised to not purchase goods manufactured by children if the products do not have labels, such as child labor-free. Examples of cases that were in the media's focus include hand-knotted rugs in Nepal, soccer balls in Pakistan, and the garment industry in Bangladesh. Theoretical models, Basu and Van, 1998, indicate that sanctions could actually aggravate the problem if the wages received by children help families meet subsistence levels also, the sanctions could be a form of hidden protectionism and not directed to children's well-being. Gossman and Michaelis, 2006, developed a model to analyze tariffs levied by the developed countries on imports produced with the help of child labor and showed that they do not reduce child labor and may worsen children's well-being.